Let's do the first verse again. Come on, sing it out. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain to bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Okay, 135, turn back a few. See 
precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other vow I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. Have a seat. Well, good morning. For those of you that have been coming to church for a while, You'll understand the importance of what I'm saying when I say this, but we've been camping this weekend and I haven't had very much sleep. So today's going to be a wild one. Just letting you know. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's going to be good. I want to say uh, thank you to those who have chosen to worship with us today, and uh, we appreciate it very much. Um, and we don't try to take that for granted. In front of you, if it's your first time or first time in a long time, in front of you, you'll find what's called a communication card, and we ask you to fill out that, that communication card with as much information as you're comfortable with. In just a few minutes, when we do our welcome, and we shake each other's hands and tell each other good morning, that kind of thing, if you take that welcome card back to the welcome station, um, somebody will be back there, my mom or Kathleen, uh, to give you a gift just for choosing to worship with us today. And that's not the only gift that we want you to have. We also want you to have a copy of God's Word. If you don't have a Bible in front of you in the pew, uh, you'll see one that's blue. And it says, Holy Bible, right on it. It's hard to mistake it for the hymnal. Um, in just a few minutes, when I bring the sermon forth, um, you can follow along in the, in the text. And we want you to follow along in the text. And uh, I'll make page references. I'll tell you where we're at and what page number we are and stuff like that so you can follow along. But we want you to follow it because we highly value the Word of God here. We do have small groups that meet throughout the week. Uh, they are currently what we're doing, and it's been a good time. We've had, we're we're tr trying to tweak it to get it just right. But uh, we've combined uh, the men's and women's Bible study. So on Wednesday... We haven't combined the Bible study. Let me rephrase that. We meet at the same time. Let's put it that way. So we show up here at 630. Um, we have some time of prayer. After the time of prayer, we share a meal together. You get your food. You take it back to your classroom, fellowship, ladies with the ladies, men with the men. And then we have our Bible study. And we invite you to come and be a part of that because it's a great time. And I'm going to tell you something. If you think that just getting into God's Word for an hour and a half or two hours on a Sunday morning is enough to keep you fed, you're nuts. You know what I'm saying? So take these opportunities when we have them. You know, come and, uh, and, and learn and discuss God's Word and fellowship uh, during, on, to, at our small groups. The other thing that we have that a lot of people forget is that we have an adult Sunday school class that meets on Sunday mornings at 930. So if you'd like to come be a part of that, Mark and the gang would love to have you. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. But today is uh, a beautiful day, one of my favorite days. It's always my favorite day when we're baptizing folks. And so we're going to do that today. It's going to be the last creek baptism of the season, just in time, because I heard the first frost is coming just in a few days. So we don't want to be out there kicking ice out of the way to baptize folks. If we had to, we would. Amen. But if we don't have to, we won't. So we'll baptize in here the rest of the year until uh, the weather turns back again, okay? So that's happening today, immediately following the service. If you've never been to one of these, come. Because, you know, baptism is something that we share as the body of Christ. Baptism is one of the things that unites us as the body of Christ, is that we share in baptism. And it's been happening since... I mean, before Jesus became, you know, started his public ministry, John the Baptist was baptizing folks. And then he did it as an example for us. 
And folks that don't know what baptism is, I just want to tell you what it is. The scripture says that when you give your life to Jesus, you become a brand new creation. That the old you is dead. So that old you, we, we go out, we go to a place where there's water. And then we take that person, we dunk them in the water. And that represents the old you dying, being buried. And then just like, Je- and just like Jesus. But also just like Jesus, he was raised, to, raised from the dead, amen? And you're a new creation in him, so you were raised from the dead to walk in newness of life. That's what baptism represents. That's what it shows people. And it's a public profession of your faith. One of the things we're going to be talking about today is public profession of Jesus in the scriptures. So if you haven't done it, it's a good thing to do. If you haven't come to, and uh, it's not just a good thing to do, it's a commanded thing to do that Jesus gave us an example of, so you ought to do it. It's a, if, you, if you have believed in God and you've trusted him for your salvation, then follow in his command and be obedient and, do bab- and get baptized. Um, so we're doing that today, and again, it's part of the thing that we, the body, celebrate together, so I invite all of you to come. It won't last very long. We're going to go down there, dunk some folks, sing one hymn, pray, and then we'll dismiss right from there. It's at Carmody Park over in Carlisle. If you're unfamiliar with how to get there, the if he hasn't put it yet, the address will be on the board shortly. There it is, and uh, that was real short. Good job, guys. Um, but anyway... Uh, Sorry, I just got a text. Miranda, did you see that? Yeah. Um, It it involves kids ministry, so we got somebody that's not going to be here today, Um, which I'll I'll talk about that in just a minute. But anyway, there's the address. You can plug it in your phone. When you pull into the park, just keep going to the back until you get hit the loop, and then there's an open area, a path, and just walk back to that path until you get to the creek, and that's where we go. (laughs) Okay? So come and be a part of that. It'll be a great day. We do have uh, coming up a women's dinner. Uh, fellowship dinner at the Springboro Bob Evans. What day is that? 17th? Thursday the 17th? All right, good. Thank you, Dan. Um, we do next week, uh, immediately following the service, we're going to have pastor appreciation uh, dinner. We, we get together and we eat together. So come and be a part of that and fellowship with us. We'd love to have you. Um, yes. Okay. So she was just telling me that the Women's Fellowship Dinner, they do that once a month, but they're taking off the months of November and December. It's cram-packed, so thank you for doing that. Um, But anyway, they'll pick back up in January. So if you haven't gotten to one, this is going to be your last chance for the year. Um, Anyway, next week, immediately following the service, we're going to have a luncheon together for Pastor Appreciation. And then later on that day, from 4 to 7, we're going to go fishing. It's the Daddy-Daughter Fishing uh, Day. So um, dads, get your daughters, or, or, or papas, get your granddaughters, and uh, we're going to take them fishing from 4 to 7 on Saturday, and um, we're going to meet here at the church, and then we'll drive over together and, uh, and do some fishing at my, bu- my buddy's pond, and it'll be a great time. Also, if you have a, a child who doesn't have a, a father figure in their life or you know somebody to take them fishing, bring them, and gentlemen... If you don't have a daughter, but you can help somebody fish, come and help us, you know, um, and we'll get, we'll get it taken care of, okay? Then October 26th is the third annual Great American Weenie Roast, so um, come and be a part of that. And the last thing is there's some birthday cards in the back for some church family at the next deck table. Make sure on your way out you sign those. All right? Yes. Yes, you can bring a side dish. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, or dessert. Yeah. I'm real fond of banana pudding. (laughs) Hey, it's pastor appreciation. I can say that, right? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm just joking. I always joke about that, but you can bring whatever you want to, okay? Um, I want to I want to ask prayer uh, to to remember a specific prayer request. I got a phone call uh, yesterday from Steve King, and um, Steve he goes to an oncologist tomorrow. They think he has cancer, uh, rectal cancer, and John is 
right now taking him to the hospital. That was the text that we got. So um, if you would, just remember Steve. He, I asked him if it was okay if I shared it with the church family, and he said that he needs all the prayer he can get. So uh, let's pray for Steve. Sweetest, if you haven't met Steve, absolute sweetest man you'll ever meet in your entire life, guaranteed. And he loves the Lord, and he loves his church. So even if he didn't, we're still going to pray for him. Amen? But he does, and we're going to lift up our brother, okay? Um, we'll go to the Lord in prayer right now on, uh, and, and petition the Lord on Steve's behalf. And then um, immediately afterwards, we'll do our welcome, okay? Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we, we thank you um, for being able to come together and worship in this um, comfortable and cool place. And, uh, Lord, we don't take that for granted. We want, we want to make sure that we always thank you for that, Lord, because we know that it's only by your will that you sustain that for us and, and allow us to do that. So, Lord, we thank you for that. And for each of us that are here today, Lord, we thank you for each one, each smiling face as we look at, out. We may be tired, but we're here, and we're giving you what we got. So, Lord, help us in that endeavor. Help us to worship you um, with clear hearts and, uh, and a clean conscience, Lord. Lord, we, we come to you this morning specifically for our brother Steve. He is a, a sweet soul who has, who has demonstrated through his life and through his words and, and everything that he loves you very much, and he loves your word. And Lord, we ask you that you would touch your, your servant, that Lord, you would uh, heal his body and uh, make sure that uh, all that's taken care of. As I always say, Lord, doctors do what doctors do, but you provide healing. So, Lord, we pray that you would touch him, that you would heal him. And, Lord, we pray that you give him strength and comfort and endurance during this time, Lord, that whatever trial that he faces, that he knows that he doesn't go through it alone because your word says that you'll never leave him or forsake him. So, Lord, we lift him up to you. We pray, Lord, that you would give him peace. We pray, Lord, that you'd be in the midst of that uh, situation, Lord, that you would baffle the doctors and uh, remove the cancer and heal him, Lord, if it be your will. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Two minutes. Get up, shake somebody's hand, hug somebody's neck, tell them you're glad to see them. If you're not into that kind of thing, just stay seated.
Don't get too comfortable. Let's stand. Make your way back to your seat. And let's sing together. We have this awesome privilege to lift up our voices to him who saved us. We cry, Hosanna, save us, Lord. Let's raise these praises. Here we go. The praise is rising. Eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. And hope is stirring. Hearts are yearning for you. We know. Face the day, and in your presence, all our fears are washed away. You washed away.
Mixing it up on you. Yeah. 
Now be seated. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 12, page 964. See that online later. <laughs> oh, goodness. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll get started. Lord, again, we love you and we thank you for the time that we have together, Lord, and for songs that remind us that you are sovereign. You're the one who reigns and there's no one beside you. Lord, I pray that in your sovereignty, Lord, that today you would, um, that you would lead us, that your spirit would guide us through your word, and that, Lord, together your spirit and your word would shape us and convict us and encourage us, Lord, and uh, that, that, that you would have us to be what you want us to be. Lord, I pray that we glean all from your word today that, that um, you intend for us to, that, Lord, when we walk out of this place, that we won't just walk away saying, I learned something, Lord, but that we would 
be transformed by by what your word says. Lord, I pray that in the face of anything that we encounter, that we would boldly proclaim your word, that we would boldly um, share your gospel, and that, Lord, we would never uh, deny you, not with our lips or with our lifestyles. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, just the brief introduction, we've been going through the Gospels chronologically for a long time now, and um, we're doing it kind of, I wouldn't say a snail's pace, we're not going through it as, you know, we're being intentional about how quickly we do it, and so it's taken some time, and it's going to take some time to, to get through, um, but I want to tell you this, that as a pastor, you know, who's been preaching through the Gospels, it's been really rewarding, and there's a lot, you know, and I also want to tell you that as a Christian, as somebody who just follows Christ and reads the Word of God and studies it, that when you come across Scripture, uh, at one point in your life, the Holy Spirit may may teach you one thing through that Scripture that you come to later in life, and He shows you other things in that Scripture, you know what I mean? Like God's Word's rich like that. So that if you come to, you know, stories that you've read in the past, don't fret, don't skip over them, don't just skim through them because you've heard it before. Read it. Prayerfully read it. And allow the Holy Spirit to lead you through it. And that's what we've been doing um, with the Gospels. And we find ourselves now in Luke chapter 12. And we'll probably get through about 12 verses maybe uh, today. And then we'll uh, continue on after that. But we're not going to be able to do it until I get my reading glasses. You know what I may need to do? I may need to drill a hole here, put a chain, and attach some of my reading glasses to it. Because I forget them every time. Almost without fail. This is what it says in the book of Luke chapter 12. And we're going to begin in verse 1. Now, before we do that, I want to remind you where we've been so that we can put it in the context of the Word of God. So, uh, you'll remember, um, he's been kind of putting the smack down on the Pharisees, which Jesus is, uh, you know, that's what he does. You know what I mean? He puts the smack down on the Pharisees. And he did that, and he, 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 the last thing that we came out of, he was saying, woe to you Pharisees. You guys... Uh, you know, tithe of the little things. You make sure you're doing all the outside, outside stuff right, but you're just like a, 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 a tomb that people don't even know is there. You walk over it and they make, it, make people unclean. Your teaching makes people unclean. You're dead on the inside. Amen? You guys remember that? And then the lawyer's like, well, hold on just a second, Jesus. When you, tell, when you say that stuff to them, then you offend us also. And he's like, well, I got some for you too. And he lays a smack down on them, remember? And it kind of started like this, this teaching um, with kind of the Good Samaritan that kind of kicked things off this way. And the good story of the Good Samaritan, just to remind you so that we can keep that, you know, thought in our mind. Like this is, these events don't happen in a vacuum. Sometimes when we read the, the, the text, we, we take text out as if it were spoken in a vacuum. No, they're spoken in a context. And in the Good Samaritan story, if you'll remember, he says that there was a guy who was traveling down the road from uh, Jerusalem to Jericho, which was a 17-mile journey that was winding and dropped a lot uh, on the way, on the descent. And the, he, he got robbed. And some guys came and they robbed him. They took everything that he owned, uh, left him in a ditch half naked and half, or naked and half dead. And Jesus tells about three people who walked by, the guy that was laying in the ditch that day. The three people were a priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan. The priest is the one, obviously, who's telling people, teaching people the law of God and holding people accountable to that and that kind of stuff. And that guy comes along. He sees the guy in the ditch. He walks to the other side of the road and keeps on going. And then it says that the Levite, the people who helped the priest in the temple, they, this guy comes along. He sees the guy in the ditch. And he goes to the other side of the road and walks on past. Doesn't help anybody. I'm sure in today's era, they probably would have got their phones out as they went by. 
tragic that you see all these things happening and people just get their phone out instead of helping. You know what I mean? What kind of a society is that? It's not one that I want for my kids. It's not one that I want for me. And we're the, we're the catalyst of change. We're the ones that Jesus put here and said, you're the salt and the light. Right? Right. Lead by example. It reminds me of that one song. Uh, what was that song where the guys, he said, we prayed for somebody and then, well, I sent you. Remember what I'm talking about? Yeah, back in the day. Yeah, that's the thing. Jesus sent us. That's why we're here. So the Samaritan comes along, the guy that's despised by the Jews and uh, treated terribly. They hated him. They called him, you know, essentially they, they called him, you know, half-bred heretics. You know, that was how their, their view of the, the, of the Samaritans were. The Jews viewed the Samaritans. He's the one that comes along, sees the guy in the ditch, puts him on his donkey, bound, binds his wounds, takes him to an inn, takes care of him, and then pays the innkeeper to, to see that the guy gets back to health. That's the guy that did it. And the lesson in all that is, if you are so focused on the law, if you're so focused on the outward aspects of righteousness, if you're, if you're so focused on people like the Pharisees, you know, looking at you and saying, oh, you're so wonderful. You need to have the good places. Oh, you're coming to my market. Well, I'll give you 25% off. Just take that free because you're a Pharisee. You know, if you're focused on the outward stuff, if you're focused on that and inwardly dead, there are signs of it. And the sign of it in this case is they lost their humanity. The greatest commandment is to love God with everything that you are. And the second is like it, according to Jesus, and that is to love your neighbor as yourself. And he was asked, who's my neighbor? The guy laying in the ditch. That's your neighbor. The people that are around you, those are your neighbors. Amen? And so he, he, that's kind of where we have been. And then he gets the disciples, and this is what it says, verse 12, or chapter 12 and verse 1. In the meantime, now remember, hold on, let's back up one verse to the end of 11. It says, as he went away from there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to press him hard and to provoke him to speak about many things, lying in wait for him to catch him in something he might say. So that's, that's where we're at. In the meantime, when so many thousands of people had gathered together, that they were trampling one another, he began to say to his disciples first, who did he say it to? The disciples first. Amen? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that they will not be revealed, that will not be reve revealed, or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. The first point that I want to make today seems like it should be a simple one, a kind of a no-brainer that you don't have to say, but sometimes it just has to be said. Jesus even said it to his disciples. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't be a hypocrite. That's a simple point, amen? Don't be a hypocrite. One of the, if you ask somebody to come to church, one of the objections that you constantly get is that the place is filled with hypocrites. Isn't that what they say? To which I usually respond, well, if you come, we'll just have one more. Come on. You know what I mean? Now, what is a hypocrite? A hypocrite is someone who says one thing and does another. Who says one thing and does another. Or does one thing and believes another. Right? That's a hypocrite. That's hypocrisy. And that's what the Pharisees have been guilty of. That's the leaven that the Pharisees have been offering the nation of Israel. Why does he say the leaven of the Pharisees? We've talked about this before. I am no baker. Kathleen is. But this is what I know. If you take some yeast and you throw it in some flour and water and you add a little bit of sugar, everything rises up. Am I right about that part? Thank you. If you don't, you smash it all out, 
You don't add any yeast. It don't really rise up. Right? you got to add something to make it rise up. And if you got just a little bit of yeast, a little bit of leaven, and you put it in with your bread, it leavens the whole loaf. Everything's leavened. You see what I'm saying? You add just a little bit, it makes the whole thing that way. And that's what the Pharisees have been doing. The Pharisees have been outwardly acting one way, inwardly believing and acting another way. One way out in public, another way in private. And Jesus says, they're hypocrites. Amen? They're hypocrites. And they have been poisoning the nation of Israel with their hypocrisy. Jesus says that they're whitewashed tombs. Remember that? They were focused on outward righteousness, and inwardly they were wicked. Remember I told you about when they would come and they would give alms to the poor? They would go out and play instruments, let everybody know that they were coming out to be benevolent. That they were coming, look, at, look how precious those people are. You know what I mean? Look how wonderful those Pharisees are. Right? They wanted to be seen. So then when they go to the markets, it told us in the last uh, set of scriptures that, that, they, that what they really wanted, they, didn't, they weren't after pleasing God. The first commandment, love God with everything. That's not, they, were not, they did not do that. They loved themselves more than they loved God. They loved the accolades that came along with being a Pharisee more than they liked God. And sometimes we're guilty of that. We love the things that Christianity offers. We love the, we love, like when I talk about society and things like that, there are some people who believe that Christianity is a thing for good and they'll go to church and things like that. They don't, they don't love Jesus. They don't love God. They just like the things that come along with being Christians. Amen? Listen, here's one of the things that I always try to tell you. When you read the scriptures, don't read it as if you're the hero because you're not. Read it as if you're the villain because you are. The only thing that, the only thing that changes that is Christ. He's the hero. Amen? So when we read about the Pharisees, this is what I don't want you to do because if we do this, then we will succumb to the same things the Pharisees succumb to. And that is, don't point the finger and say, oh, they're so bad. Look at your own heart. Look at your own heart. Why are you here? Why do you come to church? This isn't a social club. You know what I mean? This isn't like politicians. You notice that right before elections, they get all religious. Only time you ever see them in church, and then they talk about, you know, their, you know, their faith that you don't see anywhere else in their lives except right before elections. They don't love Jesus. They love power. They love their position. They love the money that comes along with the power and the position. But inside, they're whitewashed tombs. Some of them ain't so whitewashed. I'm going to tell you that too. You know what I mean? Because you can see it. People want the things of God, but not God. A lot of folks want a Savior, but not a Lord. Amen? Here's the thing that Jesus says. If you attempt to hide what's going on on the outside, know this. You can't hide your heart from God. You cannot hide your heart from God. He sees all the way to the heart, doesn't he? That's the reason why he says nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark, shall be heard in the light 
And what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. Here's the thing. The people in this room may not ever know what goes on behind your closed doors. But rest assured that God does. We try to be so sneaky too, right? As if we're going to hide something from you. You learn very quickly, even in the Old Testament, there was this king, and he was talking about, he's like, does, does his God know the things that happen in my very bedroom? He's like, yep, he sure do. You can't lock him out. Amen? Just because your wife didn't see doesn't mean God didn't. Just because your husband didn't see doesn't mean God didn't. Nothing is hidden from him. You understand that? So hypocrisy is a waste of time. It's a waste of time to put all that effort into looking good on the outside if the heart's dead. God knows it. It's a waste of time to do what you think are righteous works when the, when the heart is wicked. As a matter of fact, the scripture even says if the heart's wicked, your righteousness, your, your righteous works, all that good stuff you do, it's filthy rags. And that's some of the strongest language in the scriptures that you'll find. It's filthy rags. It's good for nothing because he sees all the way to the heart. Amen? You can't hide it from God. Who's he telling this to, remember? The disciples first. What you do in private will be made known. We keep reading. It says, I, will te I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear whom? Fear him who, after he is killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not. You are of more value than many sparrows. You notice at the beginning he starts talking about fear, and at the bottom he starts talking about don't fear. You know what I mean? Right there in the same section, that's beautiful when you understand it. The point that he's making is, and that number two, if you're keeping score today, and I'm going to tell you, this might be a quick one, because there's a lot that's self-evident. Listen, our responsibility as followers of Jesus Christ is to live fearlessly. To live fearlessly. It baffles me a lot. It doesn't baffle me. I'm just, it, I'm going to use, I'll use that kind of terminology. It's prideful terminology. I, it doesn't baffle me. I get it. Because I've gone through it myself and all that. But sometimes we get so wrapped up into like, you know, people's usually wrong interpretations of end time, you know, events. We get so wrapped up in things like being afraid of weather and being afraid of persecution and being afraid of war, and being afraid of this, and afraid of that, afraid of the government, afraid of inflation, and afraid of, uh, we're afraid of everything, it seems like. You know what I mean? But listen, on this earth, there is nothing, listen to me, there is nothing that can do more to you as a follower of Jesus Christ than to change your address. Yes, people can kill the body. Amen? Sure they can. But listen, I, I am, I'm not a body that has a soul. I'm a soul that has a body. What you see is not Josh Clifford. What you see is the skin bag that carries Josh Clifford around. The water sack, somebody called it recently. Pretty much what it is, amen? That's what you see. That's not who I am. When you go to a funeral, right, and somebody's laid out and they got the casket, casket open and everything, you know, a lot of folks, they go up there and they talk to them, stuff like that. You, that's dirt. 
That's dust and water. That's not the person. The worst thing that they could do to you, the worst thing that the government can do to you, that the weather can do to you, that anything that, it, anything that the world has to offer can do to you, the, the absolute most dramatic, most you know, craziest thing that, that can happen to you is they kill you. The body. But if you're in Christ, there ain't no such thing as death. There's no such thing as death. There's only transition from life to life. And why they're trying to do their, their best to harm you, to kill you, they're giving you the best thing in the world. Amen? I've read the description of, this, of heaven. And I'm going to tell you right now that this place is a garbage dump compared to what we have waiting on. You know what I mean? I mean, if you just read Revelation chapter 21 and, and, and this, this vision that, that God gives John and he says, and I saw the one who sat on the throne and I heard a voice and the voice says that God dwells with man and that he'll wipe away every tear, that there'll be no more parting, no more pain. No more suffering, no more sorrow, no more sin. All that's gone because he's making all things new. But I'm going to tell you right now, if it's your prerogative, you feel strongly enough about it, you can send me there anytime you want. You know what I mean? Why we fear men. Listen, most of us, because we live in the place that we live, we don't even fear, like, people killing us. We don't think about that. We're not, some of us, most of people in the United States of America are not legitimately scared of somebody killing them. They're more concerned about health and weather and, you know, that kind of stuff than they are about somebody killing them because of the society in which we live. But that's not the way it is all over the world. In some places, you know what this is... You, what this is telling you is that we don't have any excuse to be lazy in ministry. We don't have any excuse to be lazy in ministry. You know, most of the United States, most of the people in the United States don't have any fear of somebody actually killing them. What they fear is what people think of them. What? I care care what so-and-so thinks, you, you know. And I, I love it because a lot of times the people who are like, well, I don't care what anybody thinks are the ones who are putting the filters on Facebook and, you know, all that kind of thing. Why? You, you, you're afraid of what you think and others. You know what I mean? Like, do you understand how crippling that is spiritually? You understand how, how, how when in terms of ministry, crippling that is? If you are so afraid to share the gospel because of what people think of you, how could you ever be a missionary? It's crippling. That's when Satan wins. Because you're impotent. You know what I mean? You're ineffective. You're nothing. Because of fear. We shouldn't fear anything. Why? What does he say? Don't fear people who can kill the body. If you're going to have fear, you need to be fearing the one who can not only kill the body, but also cast you into hell. Hell, very real place. People don't like talking about it these days. I don't blame you. But it's way scarier than any of the Halloween decorations I've seen or any scary movie I've ever seen. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's way worse than that. It's separation from God and eternal torment and torture. And people are like, well, how could God ever send it? He doesn't. You're already headed there in your sin. Your sin, because of sin and his holiness, you cannot have, be in communion with God. What, what communion is there between holiness and unholiness? None. And that's where you're at. That's the, your natural state of being is separated from God because of your sin. So what he did was made a way. He made a way through Christ. And it's not because of outwardly righteous works. 
In fact, it's not about your works at all. That's what the scripture says. By grace are you saved, through faith, not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's only by the grace of God, only by the work of Jesus on the cross. That's the only thing. Nothing else. There is no other path. There is no other way of salvation except through Jesus Christ, which makes the next parts of it make sense. But first of all, did, I don't want to pass this up. Did you notice what he said? He said that you could buy many sparrows for a penny. Penny, this, is, uh, this and in Matthew are the only time the word for penny is used uh, in the New Testament. And a penny is, is roughly one-sixteenth of a denarius. A denarius, as we've talked about before, is a day's wage. So it's a sixteenth of a day's wage. And for that one-sixteenth of a day's wage, you could buy many sparrows. What is he saying? To us, sparrows are seemingly worthless. Right? They don't, they don't, they're not, they don't have very much value at all. But here's the thing about sparrows. And here's the thing about God. Not one of them's forgotten. He knows every last one of them. Amen? He knows every, one, every single one of them, and he doesn't forget them. And then Jesus says, well, how much, more, how much of more value are you than a sparrow? In other words, God cares greatly for you. So you can live without fear. Isn't that what it says? You can live without fear because God cares for you. Amen? That's a powerful thing. The simple phrase that is so cliche because we put it on t-shirts and bumper stickers and you know all that kind of stuff but it's the absolute truth and it's huge it's the hugest truth that you could ever come across and it's so simple three simple words jesus loves you the god of the universe who created all that is who doesn't forget a single sparrow Loves you. Why in the world would you walk through life with fear? And I, I want to reiterate. I'm not saying why would you walk with fear. I'm, why would we? Because I do the same thing. Amen. We get in that flesh. That's the way it is. But here's the bottom line. Yes. Here's the bottom line. Number three. You have to make a choice. Look what he says in verse eight. And I tell you. Everyone who acknowledges me before men. The Son of Man also will acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks word against a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and authorities, do not be anxious about what you, about how you should defend yourself or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. You must make a choice. You, not they, amen? Internalize this. You have to make a choice. The scripture is very clear and Jesus said that everyone who acknowledges him, well, who is him? Jesus is the way of salvation, amen? That, so when you acknowledge him, and that's what it means, you know, when we say give your life to Christ, it means that you're accepting him as your Lord and your Savior. That he's, he's guiding your steps. That when you're before men, you don't have any fear. You can acknowledge Jesus before men. Right? Isn't that what he just said? To live without fear. And the next thing he says is, whoever acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge in heaven. I'll acknowledge to the angels. Think about that for just a second. I mean, you think about that. Not only does Jesus love you, not only does he love me, but he tells other people about us. He tells the angels about us. Not only does God know your name, but all of heaven does. Isn't that awesome? He says, if, if anyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will acknowledge to the angels in heaven. And if you deny him, 
then he'll deny you. If you deny him, he'll deny you. Everyone who acknowledges Jesus before men will be acknowledged by Jesus in heaven. And when you give your life to Jesus, you have access to the way of salvation. When you give your life to Jesus and you're acknowledging him before men, right, because of what he's done in you, then you have access to the way of salvation, which is Christ. But if you deny him, then you are denying God's only way that he's made for salvation. So I have no choice but to not deny you. To deny Jesus is to deny salvation. Because salvation is only in him. There is no other name under heaven by which you must be saved. We'll use Jesus' words. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. That's what he said. He's not a good way. He's not one of the ways. He's not, you know, one way that's better than another way. He is the only way. That is a totally exclusive statement. No one comes to the Father but by me. Period. The only way anyone has ever gone to God is through the cross, through Jesus. And the only way anybody ever will go to God is through Jesus. There is no other way. So when you do not, when you acknowledge him before men, when you give him your life, then you're giving yourself over to the way of salvation. When you deny him before men because you've denied him in your heart, then you are denying the way of salvation. You're like, Josh, that seems awful harsh. No, it's very loving. He made a way. Praise God. Why? Because he loves us. Because we're way more valuable than a sparrow. Amen? And we must make a choice. In other words, when you deny Jesus, you deny salvation in him. You basically slam the door shut to heaven while propping the door open to hell. That's what you're doing when you deny Christ. And then he takes this logic another step forward. And I'm going to tell you that this next passage of Scripture is the one that I get brought up. It's brought up at least once every couple months for the last 15 years and before that, before I was even a pastor, because it's one of the most misunderstood verses in all the Bible. And that is when it talks about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to clear it up for you, using the Bible. Doesn't that make sense? Let him define it for you. The reason why I think it's important is because it's been so misrepresented and people, like I've had people scared and they've talked to me about being scared that they've blasphemed the Holy Spirit so now they can't give their life to Jesus. And I've had people uh, back in the, and that was a common misperception, back in the night, not 90s, uh, early 2000s, there was a, a, a challenge that was going around. You know how they have the TikTok challenges now where people do stupid stuff and record it and people die because they're idiots, you know, doing TikTok challenges? I'm not saying they're all idiots, but a lot of idiots have died as a result of that. That wasn't funny. It's, 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 it's sad even when idiots die, you know. But it's stupid stuff that they do and then people get hurt, you know, like walking out in front of a bus is a TikTok challenge. No. You know what I mean? Well, back in the day, they didn't have TikTok and all that kind of stuff, but they had YouTube. So, there was this thing that was going at this challenge called the Blasphemy Challenge, in which they challenged teenagers to go and record themselves on YouTube denying the Holy Spirit so that they could never gain interest in the heaven. Okay? Again, they're close to being understanding what it means, but it could be that, you know, their, their stupidity, God fixes that. And then they can give their life to Christ. What do I mean by that? Here's what I mean. See, when Jesus says, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you in heaven. Right? You're, de- you're denying your, the way of salvation. You take it a step further. To reject the work of Christ and the testimony of the Holy Spirit is to reject the only means of salvation offered by God. And in Matthew chapter 12, he ties this directly to the object lesson, which is the Pharisees. So let's go to Matthew chapter 12, page 906. Page 906. 
And I want to tell you that I initially wasn't going to read all of it, but in order to keep it within the context of the Scripture, I'm going to read about 10 verses beginning in verse 22. And this is what it says. Now, listen for a second. Look at me. I don't care what your granny told you about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. I don't care what your mom and dad told you about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. I don't care what some TV preacher told you about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. I care what the Bible says about blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Amen? We're on the same page? Good. If you want to argue with me about it, you can do that after the service. But make sure that um, I've already baptized folks. Then we can talk. Then a demon-oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him. You guys remember this story? And he healed him so that the man spoke and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Can this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, It is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this man Cast out demons. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast de out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. By what power did Jesus cast out demons? Holy Spirit, didn't that what he said? By the Spirit of God. Another word for the Spirit of God is the Holy Spirit. Now, what the, what the Pharisees were doing is they were saying, well, that wasn't the Holy Spirit. That was Beelzebub. That was the demon. That was the devil. He's casting out demons by the power of the devil. And then and, and Jesus is like, but here's the thing. Who do your sons cast them out by? Because if I cast them out by the power of God, then the thing that he's been preaching since he stepped onto the scene is true. What did he preach? Repent. Why? The kingdom of heaven has come upon you, is at hand. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, so he tells us what he was, he tells us the purpose of that statement. He says, listen, if it is the case that I pass, that, that these demons are cast out by the power of the Holy Spirit, which is what he's saying, that is how it's done, then you have to face the fact that the kingdom has come upon you. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's here. That's what Jesus is saying. Amen? So what this kind of implies to us is that they got to see the physical work of God in Jesus and the healings and the casting out of the demons. And they, had, they saw the work of the Holy Spirit because that's the power by which he was doing it. Amen? They got to see what the Holy Spirit at work. They got to see it. And it's probably the case, it's likely the case, because of the rest of the context of Scripture, that the Holy Spirit was testifying to them that Jesus was who he is. Because that's what the Holy Spirit does. Amen? So, why is this sin so egregious that it can never be forgiven? I'm going to tell you why. Because when you deny the work of Jesus and the testimony of the Holy Spirit, you are denying the way of salvation. 
And as long as your unrepentant self denies the way of salvation and you remain in your sin, you will not and cannot be forgiven. You can't. How, how does forgiveness come about then? A contrite heart. Humbling yourself before God. Acknowledging him before men. Isn't that what he said? And then he'll acknowledge you in heaven. That's what, it, that's what it's talking about. That's what blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is. To, to blaspheme the Holy Spirit is to deny what the Holy Spirit's telling you. That Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And there's no one that goes to the Father except through him. The Holy Spirit testifies of that to you. I'm going to tell you something that maybe you don't know. You don't come to God because you're brilliant. You didn't come to Jesus because you're, you're, you, know, you have a super high IQ and you figured stuff out. You didn't come to Jesus because you're awesome. You came to Jesus because you were drawn by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the only way you can come. There's no other way. He draws people to himself by the Holy Spirit. And there are some folks sitting in this room right now that have rejected that draw. You've rejected the power of the Holy Spirit. You, you've attributed, you know, things of God to other things. and you, you, You've denied the power of the Holy Spirit. You've denied the work of Jesus. And as a result, in your pride, you're going to die and you're going to go to hell. And I take no pleasure in telling you that. But I take a lot of pleasure in telling you this, that you're, way, you're worth way more than a sparrow. And he hasn't forgotten one of them, and he won't forget you either. He'll forgive your sin. It will be paid for, done, finished. If you will just repent and give your life to Jesus. If you stop denying the Holy Spirit, if you start giving your life to Jesus, then there's nothing that can keep you out of heaven. For those who are worried about, well, I may have accidentally blasphemed, the scripture's clear, this is a deliberate choice. It's not something you do by accident. It's who you are. If you deny the Holy Spirit, you're denying Christ. If you deny Christ and his work on the cross, there is no payment for your sin. But if you trust him, if you give him your life, then it's already paid for. He's already paid the debt. But you're not going to do it in your awesomeness. You're going to do it in humility. That the God of the universe, to think of that, the God of the universe who I've spent my whole life sinning against, loves me. Not just a little bit, not just a little bit more than a sparrow, enough to send his own son to pay for my sin. There can't be another way to him. There can't be. I've used this analogy before, but I'm going to tell you again. If I sacrifice one of my boys to let you be with me and to be in my house, and you try to go in a back door and not come through the way that was paved with the blood of my son, I'd blow you clean out the window if you tried to come in through a window or out the back door. You know what I mean? You can't come in any other way than the way that was paid with sacrifice, with blood, with the life of the most holy to pay for the sin of us, the most unholy. If you deny that, then your sin's not going to be forgiven. But if you receive it, there's eternity of reward, eternity of being able to be 
in the presence. Think about this. All you who are dealing with stuff right now, all you who are looking out at the world and seeing nothing but hopeless despair, all you who just watch the news and the TikToks and the reels and all that, and you look at it and you're like, man, this is messed up. It's got to end, all that kind of stuff, the hopelessness and all that. You get to be, if you have Jesus and your, your sin has been forgiven, then you get to be in the presence, the very presence of hope for eternity. For those of you who look out the world and you have like a pessimist view or a glass half empty view and you see the people not helping each other, when you see people like governments not doing what governments are responsible to do and helping folks and you see you know people taking advantage of other people, pulling out their phones when people are hurt and dying instead of actually trying to help, when you look at all of that lack of love that we see in our culture and everything else, if you have Jesus then you get to be in the very presence of love for eternity. For those of you who look out at the world and all you see is darkness, you can be in the very presence of light for eternity. That's why denying Jesus, denying the Holy Spirit is so egregious. But there's hope. I know that there's hope because the Bible tells us about it with Jesus' own family. In John chapter 7 and verse 5, it tells us that Jesus' own brothers rejected him. How sad is that? You know what I mean? Well, what did he say? You can say whatever you want against the Son of Man. It will be forgiven you. Isn't that what he said? His own brothers rejected him. His own brothers denied him. But then... After the resurrection, and Jesus proved that he is who he says he is, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 14, it says that they were devoted to prayer, and it says that Mary was there and his brothers. They came to know him because they trusted the way. They once denied it and then accepted him. If you continue to deny, then your sins won't be forgiven. But if you accept him, they'll be washed clean as if they'd never happened. God forgives you. So don't reject the work of Christ and the testimony of the Holy Spirit. And you can have eternity with him. But again, this is not an accidental thing. It's a clear and deliberate choice that you must make. Don't be hypocrites like the Pharisees who reject the work of Jesus, and the testimony of the Holy Spirit. That's the path of destruction, unforgiveness, sin, and ultimately hell. But choose Christ. Proclaim Christ without fear. Because Jesus cares for you. He loves you. Amen? It's a simple message. But it's the truth. And it's the gospel. You may have walked in here today. And I'm going to tell you, you know, a lot of times I think that people, um, they get, somebody talks to them about Jesus, and they kind of like present themselves as something, they start to identify with that thing as rejecting Christ, and then because of their own pride, they stay in it because they don't want to be thought of as losing the argument. It ain't about argument. It ain't about your pride, it's about your soul. It's about eternity of hope and love and light. It's about glorifying God and not yourself. So don't be afraid of what people will think of you. The worst that they could do to you is kill the body. Be afraid of the one who could throw you into hell. That's the one you should be afraid of. But because of his love and care for you, you don't have to fear. Amen? Some of you all are like, I don't even know what to say. I want to tell people about Jesus, but I don't even know what to say. Didn't you read what the Spirit said? What Jesus said about the Spirit? Don't worry. When, they, when you get dragged in front of prosecutors and you know lawyers and all that kind of don't worry about it. Don't worry about it when you're sharing the gospel of Jesus. The Holy Spirit will give you the words. Listen, I've heard some of the most inarticulate people have some of the best testimonies. 
about leading people to Jesus because I'm going to tell you something. It's much less about the words you speak and much more about how you live. He'll give you the words. Don't worry about that. And he's giving you the word. Amen? Live without fear. Live for Christ. And if you haven't given him your life, today's a great day to do that. Don't leave this place without doing that. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your word and, and for the, the confidence that you give us in your word that, Lord, we don't have to fear. We don't have to fear. We can boldly proclaim your gospel to those who are around us and lovingly. And, Lord, that we can live it out without fear. Because, Lord, all they could do is change our address. But then we get to be with you forever if we've given you our lives. So, Lord, I pray for the ones who walked in today who during this sermon have been feeling the promptings of the Holy Spirit, who have been drawn to you. Lord, I pray that they would no longer deny the work of Jesus on the cross or the testimony of the Holy Spirit. But Lord, I pray that they would give their lives to you at this moment so that they could have access to the way of salvation, which is you. We shut the door, Lord, when we deny you. But Lord, I pray that in our humility today we'd open up that door and let you in. I pray, Lord, that uh, that you would do big things through the folks who are here and the testimonies that are represented in this room. And Lord, I pray for those who are getting baptized today, Lord, that as they begin their walk in obedience with you, Lord, that you would continue to give them the words to say, that you would give them the strength to boldly live out your word without fear, Lord, I pray that we as a church, as the body of Christ, their brothers and sisters would assist them in that effort and that they would assist us. And Lord, that we would come alongside each other and live out your word. Be your body. Be your hands and feet. Proclaiming your good news wherever you send us. And we ask this in the name that is above all names. Jesus. Amen. But stand and sing. If you need to come forward, you come. If you want to give your life to the Lord and you want to know how to do that, come talk to me. Surrender.